My name is Steven Pratchner. I'm the program manager for the PIC CPU tools in the gaming division at Microsoft. We've gotten a lot of feedback over the last few years about how our CPU tools and PICs compare with other game-focused profiling tools. You've told us that you need longer capture times, faster capture open speeds, better analysis tools, and numerous improvements to our UI, among other things. So it quickly became apparent to us that the architecture we had in place for timing captures didn't allow us to easily add the features we needed to address your feedback. So we essentially started over. We've done a ground-up rewrite. This is the first in a series of four videos introducing you to the features in our new timing captures. In this video, I'll go over the improvements we've made to capture duration, capture open times, and to the timeline itself. If you've used existing PIX timing captures, you're probably aware that you could only look at two seconds of timing data at a time. This restriction was frustrating in many ways. For example, you had to get pretty lucky to pick the right two-second range of data needed to analyze a performance glitch. So, in new timing captures, we've removed that limit. Our goal with this initial release is to let you capture data on the order of a few hours. I'm going to go ahead and open a capture of one of our test titles. This capture is an hour and a half long. But to give you an idea of the data rates we can now handle, this capture contains about 2 billion PIX event begin-end pairs and about 500 million context switches. First, notice how quickly this capture opened. Capture open times have been dramatically reduced when compared with existing timing captures. So clearly, we can't load and display all the data in the capture initially. So we scroll the capture to the middle and zoom in far enough so you can clearly see several frames of data. Now, as I start to scroll out using control mouse wheel, I quickly get to the point where the data is too dense for us to display individual elements. When this happens, we aggregate data together and indicate the aggregation in a tooltip. Then, as I start to scroll back in again, you can see it doesn't take much time at all until I'm scrolled in far enough to see individual frames of data again. A few quick things about the timeline. First, you'll notice that we now draw the names of the events in the event boxes rather than only providing them in a tooltip. So if the box is too small, we still display a tooltip, but then as you scroll in and we have enough room, we'll draw the name of the event in the event box. We've also changed the default sort order for lanes. The threads that are the busiest are sorted to the top, and by busy, we're currently using the number of PIX events in the thread, with the idea being that the busiest threads are probably the ones you want to look at most often. So in this example, my main app thread and one of my render threads have bubbled to the top, while some of my less busy workers are shown below. We're now also showing thread lanes and core lanes in the same view. So by default, core lanes show you which thread is running at any point in time, along with context switches. So in this case, we can see core 2 is executing the thread named render1. Then there are some context switches. And then it switches to run the thread named app main. So and even though we don't show the full event hierarchy in the core lanes by default, if you hover over a space where a thread is running, a tooltip is displayed that shows the event hierarchy. This is very convenient for quickly moving between the cores to see what's running at any point in time. So for example, core 2 is running my app main thread. Core 4 is running the loader thread. Here is some physics work. Here's render2 running on core 9, and so on. So showing the thread and core lanes together also allows us to do some interesting new visualizations. So I'm going to scroll a frame into view that has several context switches in it. For example, if I select an event in the thread lane, the core lanes update to show me which core the event is running on. So in this case, 
and see that our thread runs on core 9 for a while, moves to core 8, and then jumps around a few more times before it finishes. So this makes it very easy to identify threads that are not affinitized to a single core. We've also made some changes to the way we show unscheduled or swapped out time and context switches. So periods of time when a thread is not running are shown in the timeline using this hatched pattern. So I'm going to scroll into this frame. And you can see there are several periods of unscheduled time here, here, and here, for example. And as you'd expect, each period of unscheduled time has a context switch out at the beginning and then back in at the end. Another change we've made is that we now keep the event box and the name consistent across context switches. In old timing captures, we used to break these boxes up, which made it hard to tell whether you were looking at a single event that was broken up by context switches or individual instances of the same type of event. The final thing related to context switches is this core indicator at the top of the thread lane. So this tells us which core the thread is running on. Here we start on core 10, and there are some context switches. We move to core 8. This comes back to core 8, and so on. So to summarize, we've dramatically extended the length of time you can capture, we've reduced capture open times, and we've made several improvements to the timeline that we think make PIX timing captures much more useful. Thank you.